Shall we start? Okay. Okay, uh, let's start uh, next session. Next session in the network operations one. Uh, we have a uh, three speak. Uh, my name is Shishio Chair, Arisa Network Japan. I, uh, I'm a program committee of uh, APRICOT 2023. And uh, we have a three sp speaker on this session. The first speaker is Lenny. Uh, Okay. So let me figure it out to you. Good morning. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, good morning. My name is Mone. I'm from Germany. And I'm normally I'm working for this uh, bright orange company Flex Optics. We are handling some transceivers and all this kind of stuff. We are supporting also our community a lot of NOX and uh, also NOX supporting is uh, one of my side activity with the Global NOX Alliance. I'm chairman of the Global NOX Alliance and we are supporting a lot of NOX. And you can see I want to talk today about a topic we started nearly one year ago. Um, about keep Ukraine connected. So I'm based outside of Berlin. So it's um, Ukraine is 900 kilometers away from me. And give me a sec. Oh. So I'm working a couple of years in this industry and I built the own mindset and I have one motto. I'm traveling like 150, 180 days a year in different regions. And um, what I've learned, our industry is one big family. And we don't think in colors, we don't think in races or in genders, and also not in borders. And on the 24th of February, we had a start of a war next to my door in Ukraine. The Russian armed forces invaded on four axes, Ukraine. And also when I was waking up on the 24th of February, I was preparing my daughter, this little sunshine, um, for the kindergarten. And it was for me the first time I need to apologize to say, babe, this war needs to be part of your life from now. And when you're older, we need to talk about it. And... I'm an Eastern German. I, I grew up in Eastern part of Germany. I'm, uh, I was born 1979. Oh, I'm odd. And I have a special relationship with all these Eastern Europe uh, countries and also Ukraine. And a friend of mine uh, was posting at Facebook uh, something like, who wants to join me for a trip with humanitarian goods to Ukraine? And this is Patrick. I know this guy only via Facebook. And I said, dude, I want to join. We have the same friend. It's a, he is the owner of a company and he has a couple of trucks. So I got our own truck. Then we was driving with a 40 tons truck and a 7.5 tons truck full with humanitarian goods to um, Ukraine and handles this over in Lviv. This is the first border crossing we did. It was like two weeks after the war started and you can see a lot of people. We have a lighter here. All right, give me light. You can see here, all the people are coming with buses to the border crossing station and was going to Poland to find a safe place to stay during the war. Um, when I was back and uh, here also Jan and Sander, uh, two board members of the Global Knock Alliance. Uh, we I scheduled a board call to tell them what I had for experience during I was driving to Ukraine and what I have seen. And uh, every one of us is uh, working since years in this industry. And we have a lot of contacts. And I said, we need to do something. Anything, but we need to do anything. We need to help. It's very easy. but. For us, it was important what we can do out of our community. It was like we have all these contacts. Everyone was working with routers and switchers and transceivers and cables and Wi-Fi access points. And we said, okay, 
we need to keep Ukraine connected. And our project was founded. Um, why Ukraine is important? Ukraine is a very, um, it's a high tech country. We have over 80, 28 million inter internet user via fixed net. We have uh, 26 million of social media user. We have 55 million of uh, mobile connectivity user. And um, via with a population of 36 million citizens. Yeah. We have also from the infrastructure perspective, uh, 26 IXPs in one country. It's a huge amount. And we have around 50 data centers in Ukraine and uh, 2,383 different ASNs, unique ASNs in Ukraine. Our vision was when we started this project to be the link between the community, the local community. We know friends from IXPs and IXPs um, to use our context to get donated equipment to our houses. And then, I don't know, <laughs> first time yeah, we collected. Um, the vision was clear, be the link. We need to build up a concept, means who we are addressing to cooperate, like on the IXP and also ISP side. And um, we were sure we are, we are out of this community and we don't want to support the armed forces or the government. But at some point you need to work with the government together. <laughs> um, the first days and the first weeks we worked on our own supply chain. Own supply chain means for us, Rene, your garden is full of equipment. <laughs> Go with the truck to Ukraine and handle this stuff over. Um, the project was founded by five friends out of this community. Um, it's Corinne, it's uh, Natalie, she is working for Ripe NCC, Jan, Sander, and me. Why I have this uh, Red Cross, it uh, means I stepped uh, back from the active role right now. I have uh, other projects uh, I want to um, uh, start and think and building up a concept about. And we structured everything. So we have our own comms team who is responsible. Um, Corina, Esther, she is walking there. Um, she is running out, I have a feeling. Um, we have Natalie and uh, Michael. This comms team is uh, responsible for all social media activities, for fundraising, uh, donation requests, and handling also all this uh, interview requests. I'm tired of it. I stopped it. So that's also one of the part I, I quit a little bit from the active role. We um, we we'll see it later um, during our process over the weeks and months. We developed also a we call it aid coordinator. Um, we can easily add all this donated equipment into the database. The donors can um, the donors can register own account. Requester out of the disaster region can create account. Can see what is offered by donors can claim it, can say, this is my shipping address, you see the way you see that. And everything is um, scripted by our own, Sander and Iho. We have a logistic crew, we have our own supply chain, <laughs> means we have volunteer drivers with uh, Daniel Huben. Um, he is based in Western part of Germany and uh, Marcin, he is based in Poland, two hours away from the border to Ukraine. And we have two hubs, we can, use as a warehouse to collect the donated equipment, ship it there. They are driving this stuff right now to Ukraine. Without partners, no project. Uh, we are working with a uh, couple of uh, one company. Debs is our distributor. We are shipping all the stuff to Debs, who is doing the distribution to all this Vason directly in Ukraine. And we're working with the APPK and the Ukrainian Internet Association Right now, also with the Ministry of Digital Transformation and like uh, Daniel as a hub and uh, uh, marching with Leo Labs. What we did so far, um, I got a message today in the morning. It was a long night yesterday. Um, Sander was sending me this. Um, this is part, yeah, um, we shipped and collected also um, over 1,500 transceivers. We shipped, we got money, like $100,000 from SES Astra. We invested directly to uh, to buy splicing gear and OTDR stuff to make sure the Ukrainian ISPs can um, 
reconnect and restore all this fiber connectivity. Uh, we supported also a different project. It's uh, Wi-Fi for schools and shelters and bunkers in Ukraine to make sure during a bomb attack or whatever, the uh, uh, kids and the families have access in a shelter and a bunker with Wi-Fi and have uh, connectivity to the world to see what happens and can ping the family in Europe or whatever. Um, all in, we shipped around 20 tons of equipment to Ukraine. Um, we had eight trips right now. And we supported 80 ISPs and IXP to restore the internet connectivity locally. Uh, it's roughly 1.4, 1.8 million of uh, amount of money we got as donation. Also, we got uh, donations by um, by PayPal. This was uh, 361 donations with an amount of over $211,000. It's crazy. It's really cool. Um, I mentioned this aid coordinator, and then I'm coming also to a new idea. I think Xander and Jan are not really happy. Rene comes up with a new idea. Um, we have an aid coordinator, which is available at GitHub. And yes, it is a VAR, but I want to talk about um, disaster. Um, with this aid coordinator, it's free. You're getting all our support, etc., etc. You can see you uh, can see the offered items. You can uh, see the claimed I uh, claims I uh, claimed items. You can see how many pieces are received already in the VAR zone. And this is April to twenty and December to twenty. So this was my first trip, yeah. And this one was <laughs> we needed to rent a forty ton truck for the last uh, run in December full with pallets of equipment. What I said, um, a war is, the, is a disaster, but also um, we have, or we are, we are, thanks Archie for, 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 for being here in the Philippines, but also Philippines, we have uh, not 42, uh, 24, this is uh, my uh, mistake. We have 14 active volcanoes, a lot of sea, subsea cables, <laughs> can be a very bad combination. And uh, the last uh, 48 hours, we had around 11, 38 earthquakes, like from only to two up to four maximum. The last big earthquake with a seven was uh, in 2022, last year, mid of year. And when I, uh, uh, when I submitted this presentation, Philip came to me and um, please explain what is your lesson learned, etc. Um, I'm, I, I live this community and I love this community. And the most important topic is share your knowledge, share your experience. This is what we are doing right now. We are building up a blueprint, a blueprint right now with experience um, straight from a war. But I'm really sure we can use all this experience to build up a blueprint for all kinds of disasters. How to establish a supply chain, in a region of an earthquake like Turkey, Syria. What happens when we have uh, typhoons, when we have tornadoes and all kinds of stuff of disasters, which can be affecting also infrastructures. Um, I'm a friend of sharing and caring. <laughs> so we are building up a database with all information about uh, how to work with governments together, how establish supply chains, how activate uh, uh, the uh, uh, community to, to donate money. And my lesson learns is um, from the Ukrainian perspective, know what you have. Know exactly what you own for fiber. Know exactly how much equipment you have in your data center. Know exactly how much uh, equipment, how many pieces you have in a warehouse to replace stuff, etc., etc., And make it also available in hard copy, printed. The problem of a war is uh, like when you're offline, you don't have electricity or connectivity to your cloud system, so you don't have access to your data. Um, check the knowledge. Check the knowledge of um, each of your employees doing tests. Make sure everyone has enough knowledge to work on a disaster uh, recovery plan. Means, you do you know if your network engineer can splice a fiber? I'm not sure. I don't know it. But I've seen people in Ukraine, they're doing it in 15 minutes or 10 minutes, very fast. 
train the untrained, make sure you are offering your colleagues and employers enough training to, 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 to make sure they are trained in a, in a, in a, in an event of a disaster, everything can happen. Fire, earthquake, very fast. Also, wow, we have, I've seen it next to my door overnight. Use tools, network monitoring. Sorry, but I'm a fan of Kentic. <laughs> talk to, talk to the friends of Kentic. Uh, also, Doug was uh, supporting me with a lot of shards for other presentations for the government. These are the most uh, lesson learns from myself. What are um, the next for me? I'm working on a concept for a global aid coordinator to say, hey guys, we have a blueprint with all this experience. Uh, we have a couple of companies. We can work together. We can cooperate, stay together, speak to each other. And with a global aid coordinator, my idea is uh, like everyone is replacing. I've seen it with Keep Your Coin Connected. We got a lot of donations, used equipment, two years old equipment, one year old equipment, what kicked out after warranty you ended up, et cetera, et cetera, and they're replacing. And normally you're sending this equipment to a refurbishment company to make a tiny amount of money back. But also my idea is put it for two or three months into our aid coordinator. This is available globally for all kinds of social activities, refugee camps, when you want to support schools or whatever, when you have a disaster, to make sure you can rebuild your infrastructure. The next um, is what I mentioned already is uh, our, our disaster community blueprint to say, we have a database, we are sharing our experience with Ukraine, border crossing, working with governments together, um, working with local ISPs and IXPs together. That's my idea for the next future. And I'm sure our Sander is talking right now about it with uh, Jan. That's it. I'm fast. 60 minutes, cool. When you have any questions, welcome. We have a uh, uh, mic, middle of the room, please. If you have a question on the comment or something, then there. Why, Sanna? Why? Because I love you. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I, uh, I I think Rene deserves a lot of credit for starting this project. It was it was his idea, and he made it uh, possible. Um, but I think uh, I'm also one of the the board members of the of the foundation, um, and I want to uh, make it extra clear: like the tools we build and the experience we uh, we gained is available for everybody. If you know of a disaster or a situation and uh, you think, oh, we can we can use your knowledge. We can use your aid coordinator tool. Just ask. It's uh, it's there for everybody. You can use it. Also, when you have uh, the possibility and the knowledge to work with us together on more functions for the tool, talk to Sander, talk to Jan, be part of the community of the team to develop a global possible global aid coordinator with more functions. And also, I have stickers. And. Sanna is running with stickers, yeah. Also, uh, sorry, one, one thing. Um, the company Rayton based uh, Ukraine was doing a lot of good stuff. Also, thanks for, for to all of our donator donors and also thanks to Rayton to, to be very fast to restore most of the fiber connectivity in, in Ukraine. Any other questions? Cool, yeah. thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. And the next session is Tang Chan Chan Pika. Sorry. Thank you. Um, you have the um quicker in the uh okay. All right. Good morning, all. So my presentation is going to be on DNS best practices. So I'm going to talk about a tool, a framework uh, that I can has initiated. So basically, I represent I can. Uh, that's about this uh, kindness. So uh, it's always good to be back in Apricot after two years physically. 
and uh, nice to meet you, many of you, and uh, look forward to having some good uh, sessions in the next couple of days as well. All right, now, as I said, uh, this is going to be focused on the DNS best practices. So uh, if you really think of the DNS ecosystem, uh, these are some of the things that you will uh, you will see that there are many components in this whole DNS ecosystem. And also we can see that there are many parties who operate uh, these different uh, components. Now, uh, if you think about uh, the DNS ecosystem, of course, you know, we have things like the stub resolvers, the clients, and then we have uh, the recursive resolvers uh, operated by the uh, recursive resolver operators. Again, you know, in different types, sometimes it could be your own corporate, sometimes it can be the, uh, uh, the ISPs, mobile operators and so on, uh, and or it could be even the uh, public resolver operators and so on. Uh, and then uh, of course we have the uh, authoritative uh, servers. Now coming to authoritative servers, uh, if you have your own domain, you could be managing your own authoritative servers, or you may have outsourced this function to uh, another party, basically. Uh, and then uh, we also have this uh, uh, registry system as well, because DNS is a hierarchical system. So we have top of the hierarchy, we have uh, the root, and then we have the top level domains where they manage the uh, top level domain registry systems. And then they also interact with many uh, registrars uh, and then uh, resellers and so on. So if you think about the registrants, they do uh, talk to uh, the registrars, registries, uh, and then uh, they also have their own portals to update their DNS information and so on. So if you really think of this uh, whole uh, ecosystem, uh, there are many places that are prone to get uh, attacked or basically you know, abused. So that is why uh, it is important uh, for us to think about this whole system uh, as a, you know, um, with the big picture and then try to uh, apply the security best practices. Now, uh, you, could, you could be only managing one of these uh, components or one of these uh, parts in this whole ecosystem. But if you do the right thing uh, in, in your own area, then of course, you know, you can, uh, you can contribute to this, uh, uh, the whole security uh, big picture. So that's what mainly uh, we just wanted to focus on. Now, there are, of course, different uh, security mechanisms that. So I was saying that um, earlier you saw that there were a lot of these uh, red crosses where the places where you are kind of prone to get attacked. And then we have, thank you. Uh, then we have various security mechanisms that you can apply uh, basically to protect your uh, DNS ecosystem, right? Uh, there are lots of protocols. I mean, we have to understand that DNS protocol is quite old, old in a sense like, you know, it has been there for like 40 years or so when the early RFCs came back in 1980s, early 1980s, um, you know, since then, many of the RFCs had come with various uh, best practices, various security uh, enhancements and so on. So that is why we'll, we will have to actually consider uh, deploying those um, best practices and, and protocols and so on. So that is also why you see there are some uh, best practices that we can think about if you want to actually, because we know that from the stub resolvers to the recursive resolver, the queries go via uh, clear text, plain text. So if you want to encrypt those, there are some protocols as well, things like DOH and DOT and so on. So you can implement those. And then uh, when it comes to protecting the DNS data itself, uh, we can uh, deploy DNSSEC, right? So DNSSEC is there to protect DNS data. Now, uh, DNSSEC deployment is very important. In fact, um, if you think of uh, the root, the root servers has uh, signed the root zone for quite a long time, uh, more than you know, uh, 12, 13 years. 
Since 2010, the root zone has been signed. And since then, about 90% of the top level domains, they have uh, signed their top level domain zones as well. So altogether, more than 90% of the top level domains, they have deployed DNSSEC. Now, uh, then comes to the second level domains. So if you are managing your second level domains, it is very important that you also actually uh, deploy DNSSEC in your second level domain. So basically you sign, and at the same time, if you are a resolve operator, you should uh, be able to validate uh, DNSSEC uh, as well. So basically uh, you validate the DNS queries. Uh, so DNSSEC is something quite important. And then uh, there are of course other security hygienes that we should be managing, we should be maintaining things like zone transfers. If you do some zone transfers between your authoritative servers, you should be having some uh, proper access controls or uh, it's like, you know, transaction signatures, you implement those. So there are various good practices that we can always follow. If you have some registry registrar systems, uh, there are protocols, things like EPP that you can uh, implement as well. So, and, and especially, you know, if you're giving some portal access to your uh, registrants, the customers and so on, make sure those portal access, you know, you have uh, implemented proper security standards as well and so that they can uh, securely sign into those portals and so on, right? So these are again, you know, some best practices that uh, you can see in a proper, good, uh, secure DNS ecosystem. So now uh, I'll come back to this uh, discussion about the kindness that I mentioned to you earlier. So kindness uh, is, an, I mean, it's, it's a sort of an acronym, we call it as kindness. So you can see the full uh, expansion over here, uh, knowledge sharing and uh, instantiation norms, DNS uh, for DNS and naming security, it's a long one, right? And so you may have heard about manners uh, in, in many years. Uh, ISOC uh, also has been actually um, uh, talking quite a lot and also there have been a lot of work uh, happening with the manners as well. So manners is for routing security. So this is kind of uh, similar uh, effort actually uh, to, to basically focus on the DNS security aspects. So manage uh, something similar, right? So uh, it would complement each other also. So that's uh, the tool that I wanted to actually just uh, highlight here. Now with uh, kindness, the whole idea here is that whether you are a small operator or whether you are a big operator, uh, you can still try to implement, deploy these best practices. Sometimes actually, especially, you know, if you are a small operator, uh, you may not have enough resources in your staff and so on to look into, uh, you know, specifically about DNS as well, because especially in small organizations, small operators, uh, the technical team who are involved in this, you know, they could not only be looking into DNS, but also they could be looking into other network, op network operation staff, uh, the routing infrastructure and, and so on. So sometimes, you know, if you don't focus too much onto the DNS side, you may miss out some of these best practices that we discussed earlier. So that is why we want to actually come up with kind of a checklist so that uh, you know exactly, you know, these are the good practices that we, we can implement uh, so that, you know, we can try to protect our DNS infrastructure. Right, so that's that's the idea, and also actually we can uh, stay abreast with the uh, new updates related to the DNS. Now, the targeted operated uh, operators we are talking about here, uh, there are a few operator types that we or the categories we are talking about uh, within the authoritative server operators. Uh, there are of course top level domains. Uh, Earlier, I, I did mention to you about the top level domains. And then uh, there are also some critical zones as well. Sometimes you may not be a top level domain operator, but you could still be operating some critical zone within your country, right? Uh, so still, in fact, even that critical zone goes down, uh, you could be really uh, affected. And then there are some second level domains as well. So you could be actually operating your own second level domain, right? So that's another uh, operator category. And then we have the uh, resolve operators. So when it comes to resolve operators, there are closed and private resolvers. These are more of uh, corporates and so on, right? So you provide uh, resolver services only to your uh, corporate users and so on. 
And then you have the shared private operators where you know this is something similar to ISPs or mobile operators where you provide uh, re recursive service to your customers. And then uh, we also have public resolve operators where basically you, know, you provide the resolver service to the public. Uh, and then uh, we can also focus on to the uh, hardening of the core system itself. So this is basically applying the best security principles uh, to your uh, uh, network, basically, right? So we can, if we can do some um, best practices, if, if we can apply best practices in all these different categories, whoever you know that you are work, operating on, then we can try to actually uh, further improve our DNS infrastructure. Now. I wouldn't want to actually go into you know every of these uh, points, but this is you can get a generic idea uh, what are we talking about here. So if you uh, author if you are an authoritative DNS operator, uh, say for a critical zone, uh, you could be looking at things like say I told you about DNSSEC deployment. So you could be signing the DN your you could be signing your zone right. So this is something very important. And then uh, if you're going to do some uh, zone transfers be between your authoritative servers, uh, then you should be also having things like access controls, uh, uh, transaction signatures, and, and so on, okay? Uh, then the zone file integrity also should be controlled, monitored, and so on. And then uh, if you're going to, in case, even if you are running some recursive server infrastructure, uh, within your network, together with the authoritative servers, then you should be having those in separate uh, infrastructure as well. So don't put all your recursive servers and the authoritative servers into the same infrastructure, right? So what what we are telling is, you know, try to have that separation. Uh, then also, you know, you should also have some diversification. Have at least you know a certain number of minimum number of servers uh, if you run some authoritative servers. Uh, for any given zone. Uh, then um, also, if you're going to use some different DNS server software packages, it's a good idea that you can always have some uh, divers diversification there. Say, for example, if you're going to run number of DNS servers across your DNS infrastructure, uh, it is much better if you can have multiple DNS server softwares across those DNS servers. Uh, why? Because in case if you have the same DNS server running in all those name servers in case if there is some vulnerability uh, associated with any of the DNS software, then you're going to affect all your DNS servers as well. So that is why you know, it's a good practice, especially if you are running some critical uh, zone or a TLD and so on. Uh, it's a good practice that you should have some uh, different name server softwares running in your name servers. Uh, and then um, the uh, server, of course, you know, the I, I, I mentioned you about the diversified infrastructure as well. Don't put all your name servers into the same uh, rack, same data center, same IP address subnet. You know, these are you know, best practices that we normally apply. If you can have some maybe uh, one DNS server in a, a certain data center, another could be in another da data center in different cities, or you could also have things like any cast servers. Uh, in different countries and so on. So these are all best practices that you can consider. And then uh, uh, make sure that you know uh, the DNS infrastructure is also monitored so that you know exactly what's happening as well. So this is uh, some example uh, best practices, uh, it's kind of in a checklist that you can go through, especially if you're running an authoritative server or a critical zone. Now, um, pretty much you know similar uh, similar things you can apply for second level domains as well. If you are operating your own domain, own zone, uh, own zones, right? Uh, sometimes uh, if you are a, a DNS service provider, you could be also running your customer zones as well, right? So you could, you know, your customers, they come to you uh, asking for those authoritative servers. So you could be actually running those as well. And then you can apply the same principles uh, as well. Um, Closed and private resolve operators. Uh, this is uh, what I was talking about earlier, things like uh, corporates and so on. Um, one of the important thing is make sure that the DNSSEC validation must be enabled. Um, based on the uh, uh, statistics we see around 
uh, 30% of the DNS queries uh, worldwide, they go through DNSSEC validating resolvers, which is pretty good. But good thing is, you know, if we can further improve these numbers, it's much better as well. So DNSSEC validation uh, should be enabled. So if you're running some uh, DNS uh, resolvers for your clients and so on, users try to enable the DNSSEC validation. Then uh, access controls should be also enabled. Make sure that um, uh, make sure that you know you have some proper access controls, rate limiting. You know these are all good practices. Q name minimization. This is another thing that you can consider uh, because uh, from the recursive resolvers, the queries would go into root servers. But actually, the root servers do not really need the full query itself. They don't need the full. Uh, uh, full um, uh, FQDN, the uh, quali fully qualified domain name itself, because root would only respond about the uh, child level, or in this case, the top level domain level. So the root doesn't need to know everything. So you can always uh, have the uh, queue name minimization enabled in the recursive name servers. And then um, if you are again running some authoritative servers and recursive servers in the same infrastructure, you can have that separation. Don't put everything in together. And uh, uh, then, you know, things like the uh, recursive servers, they run, they should run in the diversified infrastructure as well, similar to the authoritative servers, as I, as I, as I told you. Um, and then it should also be monitored. So these are all kind of you know best practices that we can apply shared private resolve operators can do you know similar practices uh, but also they can implement further things like doh dot and so on if you remember earlier we discussed that uh, the the from the client from the stub resolvers to the recursive resolvers the messages go through clear text so in case if your users if they want some uh, security if they want encryption you can uh, run the DOH and DOT. Public resolve operators, again, you know, uh, very similar as well. So they can also actually look into this and 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 uh, make sure that all these all these best practices can be applied as well. So I hope that you got some idea about this uh, uh, this uh, best practices that we are trying to actually apply onto different operators. And again, you know, for all these operators, they must be having their own common infrastructure. Uh, basically, you know, the core can be hardened as well. So these are best practices that we can apply for the network. Things like, you know, have the ACLs, uh, also make sure the BCP38, uh, and then uh, things like manners is also being applied as well. Uh, the access controls, this is important. Credential management, that is also something quite important as well, because um, things like two-factor authentications, uh, password management. So these are all good practices that you can apply in your uh, uh, core network, right? So consider these practices as well. All right, now uh, coming on to kindness. So I went through some of these checklist stuff in detail, but uh, how are you going to actually test yourself? So there is this tool, there is this framework uh, where you can do some self-assessment. So if you uh, use kindness uh, to actually you know, uh, understand what is your network, so what you're doing at the moment, what kind of operation you're doing, are you running a recursive server or are you running an authoritative server or are you doing, you know, have you done DNSSEC, you know, things like that. So basically based on those uh, input that you provide, it will basically do a self assessment so that you know you can get an idea about your current existing um, existing practices that you are applying and if you find that okay you are not doing something right or if you can further enhance then you can always try to uh, further improve your dns infrastructure now this self assessment can be done anonymously you don't have to actually you know, provide all your details or your organizational details or your details and things like that. So if you want to do it anonymously, you can still do that. Uh, but if you want to actually join the kindness program and then uh, uh, provide these details, and if you, if you need some further instructions, how to do this, uh, how you, you know, if you're not doing something right, how you can do this, uh, where you can further improve and so on so that you can uh, do it properly, then you can join kindness and then uh, try to be a participant in this kindness. 
So, and also the good thing about this is that you can still be a goodwill ambassador and also actually others can learn from you as well. So that's the whole idea about it. Now also you can get the reports generated. So based on the uh, input that you provide, you can get a report generated through the kindness so that you know exactly uh, what you are doing currently and, and what need to be implemented and so on. So if you uh, how, where to go, where to uh, do this, go to www.kindness.org. So if you visit the Kindness website, uh, you will uh, see the self-assessment tool as well. And also you can see, you know, if you want to join uh, you, the way, you know, the process that you can join this as well. There are uh, many of the uh, operators in the world, they have already joined Kindness. So you can also uh, see which organizations they have joined. Uh, say, for example, APNIC has joined in, in, in uh, APAC region, also some other organizations. So if you feel comfortable, then as I said, you know, you can be part of this. There is also a mailing list, kindness discuss at ICANN.org. Uh, feel free to join this mailing list as well so that you can be part of the discussion for the improvements, enhancements, and so on. I think uh, that's all that I wanted to actually share. And thank you very much. If you have any further questions, I can take now or, or even we can discuss during the breaks. Please say name uh, before I speak, uh, Mike. Thank you. Uh, Jan George, uh, Six Connect. Thank you for this great presentation. Uh, I think it's a very good initiative. Uh, you're doing a good work. Um, if you're coming to the next RIPE meeting, you could also talk to the best kind of operational practices uh, task force. We are also doing some uh, best kind of operational practices at RIPE. Uh, but my question is, are manners and kind DNS some sort of cross-referenced? Because I think that people that are doing manners should also do kin DNS, and people that are doing kind DNS should have manners as, as a basis for the network infrastructure. So my thought is, should one require each other? Uh, I mean, as you saw, actually, in, in our, in our co, uh, hardening the core, uh, we do recommend uh, people to follow manners because, you know, that's always a good practice. And uh, so definitely kindness, manners, they would complement each other. It's not a must, but I think uh, the recommendation is that they do both. So I think you know, if, if, if people can do both, I think that's the best thing. Yeah, thank you. And definitely I will, uh, I will consider your other points also about the, uh, the presentation at RIPE as well. I will discuss with our colleagues over there. <laughs> thank you. Any other comment or question? Okay. All Thank right. you very much. Thank you very much. The last, uh, last speaker is uh, Jeff Houston. I have a clicker. Jeff Houston, um, I'm the Chief Scientist at APNIC. Were many of you in yesterday's panel session on satellites? I need to know because other, if you were, I won't say things. But if you weren't, I'll actually go back with some of this stuff because I personally think it's completely fascinating. And, and this actually dates back to 1647. Sir Isaac Newton, who actually postulated that if you get on a really big hill and fire a projectile, if you fire it fast enough, It'll just circle the earth. It'll never come down. And the other one is elementary gravity. If I just fire it straight up, and I think I exceed, is it 11 kilometers per second or some such speed? It's never coming down. It's heading to the moon, the sun, or somewhere further because you're in escape velocity. Now, we all thought this was cool, but so what? But it was actually in the 20th century that things started to get fascinating. Um, if you look at sort of Western literature, they took the age-old work of the Chinese in terms of gunpowder and rockets and fireworks 
And it was, I think the guy's name was Robert Goddard, who started experimenting with jamming tubes full of gunpowder and firing them up. By around the 1950s, though, we were starting to get pretty serious about putting things up there. Now, the problem with putting things up there is by the time you've actually pushed it up far enough, you've run out of fuel. So if you want to take up something really useful, you either get it up to that height and there's nothing left in, in payload, or you do the next trick, which is you shed some of your fuel and keep going up. And so you might remember, although you all look very, very young, uh, you might remember these videos of, of things like the Atlas V rockets going up, where there were three stages. The first stage was these gigantic tanks of liquid oxygen, basically. You burn those up and then just get rid of that weight. The second stage takes over and pushes you up further. And by the time you're on the third stage, you're off to the moon. You've hit escape velocity with three poor humanoids. Oh, my God, what a, what a voyage. And a, and a bit of sort of stuff around you to keep you alive. Now, it took a little time to get to that point. And the 1950s was actually a rude awakening because it wasn't just the Americans. In October 1957, the Russians managed to launch Sputnik. Now, to say that the Americans were disturbed at the time is probably understating it. And if you sort of bury, you know, look through the papers and so on, fear gripped the nation as, oh, my God, the Russians are just up there. And they were. And if you're a ham radio and you listened, it was going beep, 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 beep as this soccer ball. And it was just the size of a soccer ball. It wasn't even a Chinese meteorological balloon. It was just rotating around the world going beep, 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 beep. But we all got really interested in this. And indeed, then the space race was born. Fascinatingly, it was actually in the US that the next thing happened. The US decided in the Kennedy administration that space was not the preserve of private enterprise. Take that, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. They decided it was the governments of the world that would go to the moon, go to Mars, go to Earth, because space was meant to be above business. And the US certainly took it seriously. Most of the effort in the US in the 60s was indeed a government effort. NASA used contractors, but it was NASA orchestrating the taxpayers' money. The flag was put on, you know, the, the objective was set down. We were going to get to the moon by the end of the 60s. And they made it with five months to spare, just. Um, the fact they got there is a miracle. I think we'd all concede that. And if you ever look at the computers they were using, if you ever looked at the gear they were using, I'm amazed it ever got into orbit, let alone as far as the moon. I'm like, this really was a wild ride. You would not buy a ticket on any of those ones. You, you know, taking your life in your hands is nothing compared to the risks that were being run there. It was just guesswork. And poor old Apollo 13, when the entire thing kind of went kafuf, uh, while they were halfway to the moon, was always going to happen. Wild ride. But by December 1972, Nixon decided after Apollo 17, enough was enough. They were spending so much money. And as you might remember, America in the late 60s, early 70s was undergoing some pretty trainful, tra painful transitions in terms of social policies and so on. It's kind of no more of this space stuff. No one's watching it on television. Obviously, the voters don't want it. Let's stop doing this. And they did for many years. But it didn't stop everyone else being fascinated with this because it's not about people, oddly enough. It's actually about launching instruments and launching radio up there. Now, the thing about all of this Wi-Fi and mobile is that there's rubbish in the way. Radio works best when I see you and you see me. Otherwise, I'm bouncing off buildings and so on. But if it's up there, the only thing I've got to worry about is water. The only thing that really gets in my way are storms. It's clear. And so we started experimenting with the original Sputniks and so on, going, wow, I can get up to astonishing distances with really low power. And I can put stuff up there with not, you know, tons and tons and tons of batteries and solar panels. I can put pretty modest stuff up there. And when it transmits, I can hear it. And so we started using satellites for communication. 
because awesome, it kind of works. Now, we've experimented with a bunch of this stuff and things are hotting up because this is no longer governments anymore. Well, it is, but it's also the billionaire coterie in the US, uh, T-Mobile and SpaceX. Uh, they're now going to launch femto cells on the version two of, of, of uh, Starlink. So now your phone, I'm in the wrong building. I walk outside, I see something up there that's circling, my phone will work anywhere on the planet in theory regulations notwithstanding. Um, so yes, satellite internet services, easy. Satellite cellular services, coming. There's a whole bunch of this stuff. And if you look at any of these maps now, you, your eyes and my eyes aren't good enough, but a slightly decent telescope, you'll see these shoe boxes in space whizzing around. And this is a current kind of animation of the world up there of, I think it's the Starlink constellation. And he's only 10% of the way through. 10%. So, you know, they're in the news. Uh, I talked about Newton. Um, yeah, this. It's not 11 kilometres an hour. It's a second. It's 11.2 kilometres per second, and you're never coming back. Um, so this is the kind of map to scale that all of us use because there's kind of in this area this weird bit of, let's call it space, that allows us to live as biological life forms and why Mars doesn't work. The Earth is just big enough to actually have enough pressure to keep the iron core molten. A smaller planet doesn't exert enough pressure. The core solidifies. And as soon as the core solidifies, you get into the bad place. Why is it essential for the core to be molten? because spinning iron creates a magnetic force. Remember physics? So all of a sudden, the Earth is this gigantic magnet. Now, the sun is this gigantic source of extremely bad radiation. You know, if you made a lifelong career as an astronaut and lived up there for months and months and months, you, you are having a risk of glowing in the dark. There's a lot of radiation out there. Now, the Earth has this magnetic field and the Van Allen belt actually shields and deflects all that radiation into the northern and southern lights. And that radiation belt is between approximately two to 3,000 kilometres up to uh, 30, 40,000 kilometres out. If you're below that, you don't need to coat your satellites with lead. You don't need to radiation shield them. You can actually launch pretty sophisticated electronics that use things like five nanometer circuitry that use today's electronics. If you're up in geostationary, entirely different thing because they are going to get irradiated and blasted by cosmic rays. So the hardening, the further out you get beyond the Van Allen belt. So this inner belt is fascinating but challenging because when you're a long, long way away and 35,000 kilometres is a long, long way away, try walking it, you actually see half the Earth. You see the entire Earth. So one satellite can service half the Earth. Three satellites, Viasat, can service all of the Earth because you see the lot. So. This particular slot is really valuable because at that precise altitude, it just sits there. It's always in the same position. Well, not quite. The moon makes it wobble. You need to fire a jet or two occasionally to stop it going into figure eights. But you can just put a dish there and it works. So obviously, everyone wanted a slot. Everyone wanted to launch. And at some conference somewhere, don't know where, uh, we decided that we would divide this particular slot, 35,786 kilometres, into two degree units and space the satellites apart so they wouldn't bash into each other because you don't want that. But once you do that, we're actually surrounded by this belt of spacecraft. And this is a relatively recent map from Boeing. We're actually saying 
well, here's all the ones out there in those particular slots. Most countries, I think, get two. Someone can correct me, but, you know, it's all done by, not quite by treaty, but certainly by convention and arrangement. We all get a little bit of geostationary. So all of these things are up in the sky. They all see half the Earth. It's a long way out. Fine. But you can go low. Now, going low means you don't need a huge amount of rocketry to get there. You're whizzing around really quite fast. But what's going on is when you're only, let's say, 550 kilometres up, you don't see half the Earth. You're lucky if you see a sort of a circle of around three to 400 kilometres. So if you wanted to do a big coverage, you've got a problem. At that altitude, they're not stationary in the sky. They're moving one degree of arc per second. Like a space station, which is down at the same kind of altitude. So if I want a continuous coverage at anywhere on the world, by the time that one is at sunset, I need at least one more satellite appearing. So to make low Earth orbit work, I can't do one or two or three or 300. If I want to cover the Earth with my service, I need to do a whole lot more. So LEO means I need to launch like crazy. I need cheap, reusable rockets. And when you say that sentence 10 years ago, you'd have all burst out laughing because the best way we did rockets was we spent months building it, lit the fuse, it went whoosh, and then broke up and landed in the ocean. What do I want to launch again? We'll build another rocket. And even the, the, um, the uh, space station stuff, those boosters, you saw what happened to them. Um, this is difficult stuff to make cheap until, of course, our dear friend Elon and uh, SpaceX managed to make this rocket land and be reusable. And I still think when you look at those videos of this long pencil, and it does look like a pencil, gently landing almost pointy side down and not falling over. It's kind of, wow, that is engineering, you know, on steroids. I'm in awe of that. So low Earth orbit is challenging for all those kinds of reasons. Um, the belt is the belt that starts when laws stop. Manila owns the land. They own an area of the sea in the exclusive economic zones but they don't own all the way up to the sun or anywhere else. By convention, it's 100 kilometres. And if it's any higher than that, there are no laws. It's, in, well, I'd say international, it's ungoverned space. And so LEOs work above the law and above the top of the troposphere. Now, again, why the top of the troposphere? If you've ever looked at these pictures of what we used to launch up there coming back down to Earth, these three poor guinea pigs in this Apollo thing, as soon as they hit the atmosphere, it's just hell because a lot of heat friction gets done. The thing is trying to burn itself up and the people inside it, huge heat shields. You haven't got that on a satellite. You have to stay above the troposphere. And you kind of go, well, that's easy, isn't it? Sort of. Because whenever the sun gets angry and it goes in, I think it's 11-year cycles, solar flares, et cetera, the amount of solar radiation gets large enough that it actually scrapes through some of the Van Allen belt and starts to heat up the atmosphere in a radiation kind of sense. Anything that gets hot expands, the troposphere lifts up, intersects with the spacecraft. Oops, bad news, they burn up. So you need to get high enough that the risk of solar activity burning up your fleet is low enough to be sort of, I can manage that. So that's why this kind of belt between 160 kilometres, you can't get much closer. At 2,000 kilometres, yeah, you're starting to get too far away to be really useful. So somewhere in there is kind of useful. Above the atmosphere, below the Van Allen belt, it's kind of the sweet spot. And, and that's the spot we work in. Now, these things whiz around, and I said 550 kilometres in the case of SpaceX, and they're visible from 
God, my eyes. Uh, 2,700 kilometres away when they rise above visibility, whiz down and then they disappear again, 2,700 kilometres away in the other direction. And again, here's this map of the current fleet on, on Starlink, um, the, the uh, Starlink constellation, where they're all going in eccentric orbits. Very few of them are polar. They actually go right up to about 53, 54 degrees, but they don't go any further north except for a couple because, you know, folk are doing oil in Prudhoe Bay in Alaska. They want coverage. A few satellites are polar. But, you know, that's pretty typical of this stuff. Now, that's about as much as I wanted to do on that area, but I was told I have a fair deal of time, which is why I spend time mucking around with it. But I actually was interested in performance because we've had a lot of experience in using satellites and geo. Indeed, the first internet services into Australia were done on geostationary. Now, they're a long, long way away, 35,768 kilometres, but that's if you're right underneath. If you're over there and going sideways, it's longer. And on average, the ping time up and down, up and down, 660 milliseconds, two-thirds of a second. So it's long, right? But it's really stable. So high delay, high stability. Um, Leo's, very low delay, 550 kilometres, that's next door in terms of the speed of light, two, three milliseconds. But they're whizzing. So they're 2,700 kilometres away, long delay, 500 kilometres, 2,700, all in the space of less than, you know, 60 minutes or so. In fact, it's about 20 minutes. So you'd find a huge amount of jitter in the characteristics of a service if you're tracking one of these Leos. Now, someone, is he in the room? My boss and his farm, which is in the middle of nowhere in northern New South Wales, was running um, the uh, Australian National Broadband Network, Skymuster. Who thought of that name? Um, and it was on a geo service, but it really was interesting, and we'll see why. And he said, it's got to be better. And, and they did a deal, the Australian government, to give licensing for Starlink to actually operate in Australia. So it's one of the few countries, Chile, I'm not sure, France maybe, certainly the US and Canada, where you can actually buy a Starlink service as a, as a consumer. And for a little bit of time, he had both. And I was at the other end. So I commandeered his services and started looking. And, and I'm actually really interested because over the last 15 years, we have never, ever thought about customising our transport protocols for these services. We just take the TCP out of the box, the TCP in your mobile phone, the TCP in your laptop and go, oh, yeah, it'll work. But will it? Will it actually work on these rather bizarre circuits and systems that realistically are quite rare? And could you do it better? Or is there some variance? And so I actually looked at three algorithms which are these days in common use. Uh, the first is, geez, traditional TCP, if it has one, which is a flow control algorithm called Reno. And this is in all the textbooks. If you've ever done, you know, networking AO1, they teach you Reno. The algorithm is really simple. I don't know how fast I can go. So just keep going faster until something happens. Now, we know what's going to happen because as you jam more packets into your connection, the buffers inside the network start to fill. And so what actually goes on is you're keeping on getting the same good put, but you're pushing more packets in and the queues are building. At some point, the queue gets full and the next packet that comes along gets dropped and your TCP connection gets very sad and everything comes to a halt. You've got to repair the loss and TCP says, wow, I was going to too, going too fast. I'm going to halve my sending rate. So I was doing 100 packets per second. I'm now going to drop down to 50 and then do it all again. It's a bit like driving your car down the freeway. Keep on going faster until you have a smash. Don't stop. 
just halve your speed and do it again. You know, that's the way TCP works and that's the way Reno works. That's pretty coarse. That's really coarse. And Reno isn't that good, but it's all we had for a long time. The researchers started mucking around. And the next one, which is in really common use, really common use, most Linux platforms use it, is Cubic, which instead of going faster and faster and faster, tries to figure out, oh, I should be going at this speed. So it accelerates quickly to the sending speed that it thinks is right, and then just edges very closely to the precipice of packet loss. As soon as it gets packet loss, it drops down again and tries it again. So cubic is actually a cubic curve, X cubed, that sort of moves into that sweet spot of packet loss. It's meant to be faster because Reno is quite coarse. Cubic's meant to give you better throughput. And the last one is actually work that was done uh, by Google uh, called bandwidth bottleneck rate, completely different model, completely. It's actually based on the round trip time. You know those queues that are forming? As a queue forms, your round trip time gets worse because the packet's going, when's it my turn, when's it my turn, when it sits in the queue. So what BBR tries to do is to keep that round trip time down to the minimum, down to the minimum and run at that speed because at that speed, I'm filling the wire and not the queue. So BBR works best when there are no queues and it works best when the network actually has very little routing buffers. None of you build equipment with no buffer space. You learned from the sad, sorry history of ATM and now you buy routing equipment has this enormous amount of memory in your line cards because that's what you buy. BBR says, nice try, you're completely wrong. I don't care what you have, I'm going to do it differently. So BBR doesn't touch buffering. It's a completely different protocol. So I'm gonna use those three protocols across my three services. Um, there's no fiber at Paul's farm, so I'm using my spot. Um, so I've got fiber from Brisbane to Canberra, uh, Geo from uh, Brisbane to somewhere in the bush, and Leo from Brisbane to somewhere in the bush. Uh, cheap machines, just an Intel NUC running Debian 10, and I'm using iPerf 3. So here's this kind of idealized view of the way these protocols work, which, if you're into protocol engineering, I think it's fascinating. So, Cubic is kind of, wow, that really is a cubic curve. Here's the sweet spot in this experiment. And as you see, it kind of moves up gently to this 250 megabits per second. But when there's no incident, it kind of goes, oh, oh, there's free space and moves up very, very quickly going, well, I'll just see where the limit is. The queues filled at 300 megabits per second and it immediately dropped back. But it didn't halve. It just went back to 200, and that's traditional cubic. Uh, Reno, this is the standard kind of Reno view, uh, 250 to 150, so it's, it's doing rate halving, gradually builds up, Q fills, disaster happens, halve the rate, do it all over again, and again, and again. BBR is weirdly different, because BBR kind of goes, wow, let's see how big the play space is. And it immediately starts sending at 300 megahertz per second, disaster happens. Q's fill, whoops, shouldn't have done that. But it backs off to what it thinks is sustainable. And in this experiment, it's a different circuit. I'm running this one at 100 megabits a second, and it sits there. It just sits there. Q's don't form. Because BBR runs blind for seven out of every eight round trip times. Once it thinks it knows the capacity of a circuit, it just goes, I don't care what the rest of you folk are doing. I'm going at this speed, get used to it. You know, it's on cruise control in the car. It just goes, cars ahead of me, don't care. I'm going at this speed, get out of my way. Every eighth round trip time, it goes, I'm gonna go 25% faster, because I can. If my delay increases, 25% faster means I'm filling queues, that's too fast. I'll back down, drain the queues and resume my speed. If nothing happened, 
I'm now going 25% faster. And I'll do that again and again and again. So BBR is entirely different. So here's terrestrial fiber and server and client, 1,000 kilometers down the East Coast. I've got V6 and V4. Uh, this is a Telstra service. G thanks Telstra. Um, V4 is slower. V4 is on average one millisecond slower. Why? Ask Telstra. I have no bloody clue. Um, the other thing about this kind of test is I'm kind of on fiber, but I'm seeing a huge amount of noise in these round trip times. Other folk, damn them, are using you know the same bearers, the same carriers. So this is the elemental pings, you know, across G's, 1,000 seconds, where I've just recorded every single ping, and that's pretty typical. How does that affect it? So I'm doing a really detailed trace of Reno where I'm giving you the throughput every RTT. So I'm doing a packet capture, I'm doing a reanalysis, and I'm basically showing you what goes on. So I start with one stream, runs at 270 megabits per second, which is faster than the quoted rate. The quoted rate was, uh, what did I say there? I'm going backwards, 275. So it was real. Okay, so... God, they delivered what they said. What a surprise. Um, and then after a while, I turned on a second Reno, right? And the two started competing. The first one was clogging all the queues. The second one was aggressively forcing itself into the queues. Eventually, they're trying to equilibrate. And after 100 seconds, they sort of get used to each other. And because it's the same distance and the same flow control, they do equilibrate. And they're sharing by about 120 seconds. I turn one off and immediately, and that's not Reno, this is actually Linux. Linux takes over and goes, I remember the original speed. I'm going to run at that speed. And so it overrides Reno and just goes straight up to 275 megabits. You had a question, Sanus? Shout it out. Uh, green, I, I turned off the first one and left the second one running. Meh, same thing, really. Um, so, yes, uh, as Stefan said, it wasn't the original session that resumed, but the system knew the capacity to the remote IP address. Clever little, clever little Linux. I wish they wouldn't. It makes these tests more challenging when the operating system gets in the way. Cubic. Why run Cubic? It shares faster. There's only 275 megabits per second in the circuit, and I'm running it as fast as it can possibly go. But when I bring up the second session, it kind of mucks around a bit, but by about second 42, it's sort of gone, oh, we're sharing, are we? Okay, let's share. And then it goes a bit unstable, and then it gets more unstable. I don't know why, but it's not that bad. They're sharing. Turn one off, the other one goes straight up to wire speed. Firstly, there was a lot of jitter. The second time it gets there, rock steady. And that's Linux at work. It's nailed it. It's not even probing anymore. 275 megabits? Fine. That's what I'm running at. Thank you, Linux. Um, BBR. Oh, BBR. Look at that. As soon as you turn on the second one, it goes, let's share. Almost immediately, because it only takes 16 round trip times to get there. And then it just sits there and sort of swaps tiny amounts of increment either way because it's not using buffers. It's not. And you can see the pulsing every eight RTTs. And so it's pulsing and equilibrating. Turn one off within one RTT, because this is BBR, it's up to full speed again. So BBR is a killer. If you're not running it, you're running slow. That's obvious. And for fiber, this is fantastic. But this talk isn't about fiber. You know, this talk is actually about satellites. So back to the farm, back to a service over a geostationary. So here's the ping times. Um, yes, that scale really is it. 650 milliseconds, two thirds of a second, 700, 750. Uh, and yes, that really is up to a second. It's kind of, yeah, come back when I wake up. Um, shared circuitry. It's really looking at everyone else's traffic and the state of the network buffers. So the ping profile is kind of really bad because that's moving 
10, 20 milliseconds per ping and really long. So this is going to stress out most protocols because I only hear what happened two thirds of a second later. So I'm pushing packets into the blind and there's no feedback. And so you'd expect this to go pretty badly. Reno isn't that bad. Now, the quoted capacity of this is a 45 megabit service. And you can see it sort of moving in. It's overestimated. And whenever it tries to move up a bit, it gets packet loss. It keeps on correcting itself and actually stabilizes. I bring on the second surface and the light green is the total. Those two are busy fighting it out, but the total capacity, 45 megabits as quoted. So Reno is actually doing pretty good until 100, second, 100 seconds later when it just loses it. It has a hissy fit. It's on the floor, legs in the air, wailing at the moon going, what's happening to me? I have no idea. Somebody else is streaming Amazon Prime, I guess, shared circuitry. But as soon as they do this, all these control algorithms just go to hell. There's no salvaging it. And throughput is just crap because the long delay, there's no stability left in the system. The queues are behaving erratically and it's not me. Reno gets very confused and it doesn't exert pressure on the other protocols. It's not pushing everyone else out of the way. It's just a victim. And that's why you get really crap performance out of these systems. They're a victim of everyone else. If no one else is around, you're doing fine, long delay. As soon as someone else joins your party, the house is wrecked. It's trashed. Um, cubic, well, very similar story, oddly enough. You can see cubic coming in, 45, 45 megabits per second. Equal, you know, they, they, they share pretty quickly, but then they see the neighbours. And as soon as they see the neighbours, it's all over the place. So again on Geo, because of the very long loops and the large amount of memory, this is not working as well as it could. BBR, <laughs> neighbours, what neighbours? I'm in control. This is mine. I don't care what happens to you. Maybe these other folk in the early ones were running BBR. But you look at BBR and it kind of goes 45 megabits per second shared across two, no problem. Cross traffic, I'm not seeing a thing because it doesn't look at the state of the shared network buffer. BBR ignores it for seven-eighths of the time. So what all those other silly protocols are doing, BBR is kind of going, I'm okay. I have no problem. So why do folk run BBR? For that. It doesn't matter what else is happening on the network, I'm using it. Stand aside. It's not a social protocol. It's not a nice protocol. But if it's your protocol, you're a winner. Um, so that's geo. So RTTs, this is bad. The instabilities are all over the place. BBR is the best you can do on a geo. And it's not bad, but it's still a long delay. Someone asked me, I think it was Terry Sweetser, if he's in the room, well, why don't I use a TCP accelerator? Why don't I put a middleware in there to make it all go faster? Uh, that's a very long delay. Every byte I send, I have to keep a copy of for two-thirds of a second. So on a 45 megabit service, I need to keep a copy, right, of 30 megabits of data. If I'm running a system that doesn't have a large TCP buffer space, I'm the problem, not the service. But if I use what they call a TCP accelerator, which terminates my service just before the satellite loop, and it has big buffers, by sort of creating two TCP loops, I can recover space. So TCP accelerators is a bit of a misnomer. If you've actually got a decent machine with decent memory, it's not useful, it's net negative, but if you're using some limped, hobbled version of whatever it is that has no memory inside it, you're toast, and, and this will help. But so yes, the answer is TCP accelerators, yes and no, it's up to you and your devices. So now let's go to Leo's. I love these maps. If you go there, it's animated. It's an The little dots move. I sort of sit there and stare at it for hours. Wow, they're moving, so cool. It's meant to be real time. I really think it's an animation, but you can see the eccentric orbits. It's, it's so amazing. Um, sorry, let's focus. Um, the, same, the same website actually shows you his launch rates 
The big plan is, and he's got around 4,000 up there, the big plan is 30,000. We should all be very concerned because you remember how a nuclear chain reaction works? If, if you have enough unstable bits of uranium, U-238 around, and you break one apart with a fast-moving neutron, the little bits of stuff hit other uranium atoms, they break apart, it becomes a chain reaction, and things go boom. That's what's happening at the atomic level. Up there, in a very narrowly constrained orbit that's jammed full of, I don't know, 100,000 satellites, their relative speeds to each other are really fast, faster than bullets. And if you manage to break one and send little bits of broken satellite around in that slot, that will hit other satellites, which will break them and send other bits of satellites into crash into each other. And ultimately, the space gets trashed. We have no way of getting the fragments back. So this is a one-shot use. And once we break it, it's gone forever. Because you can't vacuum space. You can't clean it no more. Uh, it's up there. So he's launching like crazy. He's going to go 10 times this. The red line is kind of interesting. Um, that's the burn rate, the rate at which they die. And, and this is the, a few of them encounter atmosphere, dud launches, whatever. So there is a burn rate um, and, and sort of slowly increases, but his launch rate is, is really very, very high. Um, the altitude, 550 kilometres. That's really close. That's really close. Um, 1.8 milliseconds away when it's right above you. 3.6 milliseconds away when it's over the horizon. Why? Fibre is slow, 0.65 of the speed of light. But you're not using fibre, you're using effectively electromagnetic radiation in an atmosphere for a certain amount. So let's go 0.9999999 times the speed of light, just subtly slower. So this is fast, really fast. So when I do a ping and I've got this dishy thing tracking, I should see pings of around 7.3 milliseconds to 14 milliseconds. Down there when it rises above the horizon, if that's the only one I see, 14 milliseconds away. Right above me, round trip time, 7.3. Nah. Nah. What are they doing? That's 60 milliseconds. That's 2,000 seconds. And I never got better than 40. And you're kind of going... What do they do? Do they have some packet freezer locker that takes this packet and sort of puts it in the locker for 30 milliseconds going, look, just in case, I'm going to sit on this packet for 30 milliseconds because, because. So I have no explanation as to why I'm seeing that. You know, there's 12 milliseconds in this graph that's terrestrial. I've got to get to close up and down, right? So that's 12. The propagation in space, as I said, is between 7 and 14. And the 30 milliseconds is, is, you know, the Elon tax. I, I, they don't talk about it. I have no idea. I don't know if anyone remembers the early work in radio and IP when I think it was, uh, who came up with it? ARQ, where they tried to make a reliable radio circuit by using tiny, tiny cells of data. And whenever one got corrupted by radio, everything stopped and it resent. Yeah, gee, thanks. So TCP behavior was crap, but it was a really good circuit. Um, they may be doing that. I don't know. But it's kind of curious that it could be so much faster, but it's not. Um, now, here's Reno across this. So Starlink don't say it's an X megabit per second service. But in reality, it kind of starts somewhere oscillating between 50 and 150 megabits per second. And there's no stability here. Everyone's kind of going, woo, woo, what's happening? Um, it sort of works at 100 meg. I bring up the second service and it kind of goes, oh, and it starts at 200 megabits per second. Reality quickly takes over and the two combined sort of oscillate between 50 and 100 megabits per second, but it's unstable. Now, I should go back to over 2,000 seconds, I did a handover between these rotating satellites at least 10 times. I see no evidence of a handover. Those intervals 
are not regular enough in my mind to show that I'm handing over to the next one. Why aren't I seeing that? Is that part of that 30 milliseconds of, well, I'm just putting these packets in the box to give you a more, you know, cleaner service? So it's not handover that's causing this behavior, but Reno isn't happy. It's just not happy. It kind of started, whoa, up to 250 megabits per second, and then it was all over. And it just sort of goes, you know, oh, God. And by the time I sort of finish, I'm down at 30. Oh, sad. Maybe it's the wrong protocol. Let's try cubic. <laughs> Same day, you know, slightly later in time, and cubic kind of going, I'm not even going to try. You know, 50 megabits per second, that's it, tough. And when I take one session away, it gets no faster. It doesn't actually take up the space. Now, some would argue, Dave Tat, one of them, saying this is actually buffer bloat. I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced the problem is massive buffers because that's so unstable that that's not a usual signature of very, very large buffering. Large buffering tends to go down, down, whereas this thing is just blah, 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 really quickly. So not clear what's going on, but the sending rate just isn't rising. But never fear, BBR is here. BBR just doesn't care. And for something like, you know, geos, the first session starts at 150 megabits per second and just sort of hangs around there. The second session starts up and the aggregate gets up to 300 megabits per second because it's kind of going, I don't care. Now, they stabilise a bit, but they, the aggregate only goes as low as 100. But after a while, it's muscled everyone else out of that cell. It's muscled everyone else, and it's sustaining a decent 200 megabits per second. Yes, there are instabilities, but, you know, I've got a huge amount of bandwidth. I've got a huge amount of throughput. Um, because BBR doesn't back off with packet loss. It doesn't care. It just repairs packet loss at full speed. So what's going on now is this stuff is actually pushing everyone else out of the way and managing to sustain around 200 megabits per second, whereas the other protocols were really scratching away at 30. What would you run? I know what I'd run all the time. If I was Paul, I'd be running this and putting it by default. Um, so... We're on time. Um, clearly, Leo is better. That's cool. But the choice of protocol is really important because the way they've engineered Starlink, the traditional protocols fall flat on their face and just don't extract performance, which is a shame because it's a brilliant service. But if you run the right protocol, BBR, and you elbow everyone else a little bit, you get amazing performance no matter where you are on this planet as long as there's an earth station near you. So it's, you know, really good. However, if you really want speed and you're in the right space, don't throw away your fiber because you can always make fiber go so much faster no matter what. But, you know, if you're a long, long way away from anywhere, um, I would certainly go Starlink at this point and I would run BBR as, as sort of the two minimum to actually make it work. A um, few questions. I'm using iPerf3, Linux, iPerf3. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff in this kernel that I don't know anyone even knows anymore. Um, I really find the Debian felt developers annoying these days. Minor rant about locking in a capacity. I want that kernel capacity stripped out. I just want raw TCP. Would Quick do even better? Quick and BBR. Oh, there's a thought. There's a thought. I think I'll test that. Um, the 5G promise. They're actually going to put 5G on, on, on these craft. I want to compare the two. I'm not looking good for 5G, I don't think. I think it's going to be crap because it's 5G. But, you know, it's an interesting comparison. And, and this is this whole thing about where's that 30 milliseconds going? If they gave me the raw capacity, would BBR go even faster? I think it would. If they gave me back those 30 milliseconds they've robbed from me, I think this would actually really stress out Starlink. It could really work and sing. So, yeah, there's more work and more measurement. If you're interested and you can get hold of someone who, who has one, use it. 
If not, we'll see if Paul Wilson will help and donate, donate some time on his. Um, so does it scale? Fiber scales. Does geo scale? No. Two degrees of slot per, per service. It's too far away. It's never going to scale. Leo, uh, 3,000 spacecraft up there, looking good. 30,000, sketchy. A million, never going to happen. It's just not enough space up there, oddly enough. And junk will cause all this to fail probably in our lifetime. So you've got a brief window of opportunity. Exploit it before it all goes rotten. Elon is. Elon's doubling the size, doubling the capacity, putting lasers on. In theory, the lasers are aimed at other, you know, Starlink services so they can talk to each other. But you kind of wonder if they're not also offensive lasers to actually hit the Amazon ones and take them out. Who knows? But they're going to have lasers. You're going to go up and across and then down. So all of a sudden, you don't need to be near an Earth station. You can be anywhere on the planet and zip around and come down somewhere else. Interesting. It'll support 5G. I don't know about the routing inside there. Lasers. Looking amazing. Launching today. Launching yesterday. Launching now. Um, and I'm bang on time. It's lunchtime. We'll take a couple of questions and then we're done. Thank you very much. One. Yeah. Time is exceeded to one or two questions. Understood. Hi, everyone. I'm Mia Perez from the Gender and Diversity of APNIC Foundation. I was about to ask yesterday during the session, but it also ran out of time. Um, I was Before, I was part of a community networks project here in the Philippines. So um, this is a local question. As you may already know, Starlink is already in the PH market. Um, quoting one of the press release from our government officials, um, Starlink is a game-changing technology, perfect for our archipelago, and will definitely significantly bridge the digital divide that plague uh, many countries uh, like, our like the Philippines. So while this could uh, possibly be true, I know that you have already given us um, the brief overview and the test. And from Ulrich's uh, um, talk yesterday, uh, there could be differences in the geographical location. So in your perspective, how appropriate Starlink is for the Philippines and as a buying public, when do we start buying Starlink? It's a toy for the rich. <laughs> no, seriously, at a hundred bucks a month and a thousand dollars for Dishy in Australia, they're pretty cheap according to the Australian GDP. But yesterday you saw in Nigeria, it was still... 500 bucks for Dishy or the equivalent, and I think it was $50 a month for the service, when the average income is a whole lot less. There's no discounts for the Philippines or Nigeria or anyone else. So game changing says, is it right for my GDP? Is it accessible and affordable? Not in the cities, because it's useless in the cities, in rural and remote, where the income is really low. And that's what you've got to struggle with and everyone else about pricing. So it's a great question. There's no clear answer. Um, I'll do it either way, if that's okay. So, so John. Jonathan Brewer here. Oh, my. Uh, yeah, you're there now. Jonathan yes. Brewer here. The, the question is, would you... Thank you. Um, would you consider taking these tests and using them on terrestrial 5G networks? Actually, I would, and I should... And I haven't got around to it. But that kind of protocol test in radio land is fascinating. So thank you for that suggestion. I will bookmark it somewhere between here and here and actually get around to it. I have 5G. You know, yes, I, um, great thought. Haven't done it. I, I would further suggest that you do it in a vehicle with a roof-mounted antenna and see what it looks like when you're having cell handovers, because I think you're going to see similar performance to the Leo. And I'm meant to drive at the same time? <laughs> or do I get a driver? <laughs> you're meant to run these things while you're driving, but actually I did have a driver doing LTE uh, handover testing just recently, so uh, it, it can be done and it's fun. Thank you for the suggestion. I'll, I'll, I'll take you up on that. Andrew Six Connect, very quick question. If there will be 100 other people at the same place at the same time doing the same experiment over the same satellites with BBR, would that push you back to the Reno performance? 100, maybe not. There's a lot of downlink capacity on the spacecraft. And there is a certain amount of limiting per, per sort of endpoint. 
A million, you're dead. A thousand, you're not sure, never tried, never got a thousand people in the same cell point. But there is certainly a limit to the amount of spectrum. But I don't think you're going to hit it at 100. Right? I think what's going on there is a rationing inside Starlink rather than a rationing in capacity in terms of spectrum. That's my, but you should talk to John, and I'm going to put his name down there. He does know more about that aspect of it than yeah. me. Encyclopedias more. So, yes. So B BBR is dangerous just if you're- Oh, it's wonderful. If you're overdoing it with the capacity. None of you are allowed to run it, only me. Yeah. Is that us a question? Sure. Narelle. Hi, Jeff. Narelle Clark here from the Internet Association of Australia. Just wondering, did you didn't really describe the, how many um, boxes you use in how many? So you just have the two locations. I have two it. Intel NUCs. So one at total one cost eight hundred bucks. Yeah. Okay. So and and the rest is it, all software. You ran it once. Oh no, I ran it for about, it for about a week. For about a week. Okay. The, these are the cleanest ones so that showed the point. So there were no like Call of Duty updates at that time. Oh God, no! Well, well no, I don't believe so. No. Time of day. No. no. I think there's a bit more work to do a proper statistical analysis here. Too, oh, anyway. there's there's a huge amount of discussion yeah. forums on Starlink performance all over the world. We're all interested in this topic. And, and if so, you do it by, with five G or something, you'll need to take into account things like cell breathing throughout the day. And well, in some ways, you're trying to look at the characteristics of the service against the performance of the protocol. Because the whole idea is here, does Reno work? Not very well. Does Cubic work? Uh, sort of a bit better. Does BBR work? Oh, my God. It looks like my old peer-to-peer -peer graphs from a few years back. Exactly. So okay. uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Then the uh, session will be closed. And uh, we have a cell open lightning talk, which is uh, uh, 10 minutes uh, speak. Uh, up to the 10 minutes speak and the next session will be started 2.30. Okay, thank you for attending the um, session. Oh, 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 oh,